Greetings, Power People. This is uh, Evan with Power Comics, and uh, I have another unboxing video uh, I want to do today because I just received a package from Bill W. Miller, who is the uh, writer of the original uh, John Tarr uh, series. As you know, a few weeks back, we interviewed Tony Lorenz, who is the artist of the first issue of John Tarr, but we were able to track down Bill W. Miller. Uh, to ask him uh, some questions about the making of this infamous book, um, and as well as, you know, discovering that he ran Miller Publishing, uh, and also um, Mature Magic, which is what it was called before. Um, and he and his father actually published a ton of these self-published uh, small press comics. So we tracked him down, um, and he sent us this box, and he also sent us this amazing cover letter, here, uh, which is, if you'll notice, is typed uh, on a typewriter, and this is very detailed, uh, very, uh, it's amazing he took the time to write a personal letter to, to me, um, uh, giving us a little backstory on each of the comics he actually sent us, uh, which is super thoughtful, but also, I should mention that we are doing a, an interview with Bill W. Miller soon, it has yet to be yet to be uh, scheduled, but it's something that we're looking at doing very soon. Uh, he doesn't own a computer, uh, hence the uh, typewriter note here, uh, okay. nor does he have a cell phone, so we're doing it, uh, you know, I had to send him interview questions uh, in, in the uh, U.S. mail, so we've been corresponding on, on landline and U.S. mail, which is a very appropriate uh, <clears throat> for the work that we're about to display today. That being said, let's get into it. So he sent me all of these, and there's a couple in here I threw in for my own collection just to give extra context, but let's dive in. Obviously, we're all familiar with John Tar 1. It's a comic book we idolize and uh, worship here at Power Comics. Not much more needs to be said, but this is kind of the one that launched it all for him. Um, on that note, I also want to point out that he did send us this article, which is amazing. Uh, this looks like a Xerox of... Um, a news story that ran in, in the local uh, Illinois paper, paper, excuse me, where he grew up. Uh, it looks like it ran in spring of 86. And this is him right here. This is Bill W. Miller. Um, this is his father, Billy G. Miller. Um, and I believe that this right here is Dane Barrett, who actually would go on to draw John Tarr's issue two and three, which we'll show here in a second. Um, <clears throat> And this is them uh, sort of celebrating, uh, you know, selling and distributing these comic books, which apparently were successful. In the Tony Lorenz video, uh, I think he said something about 5,000 copies being sold. But actually, John Tarr here, uh, it's first, uh, it says, the artist for the comic book John Tarr, which sold 25,000 copies of its original issue. So that means this comic book, allegedly, it's in print here, sold uh, 25,000 copies on its initial run, which is just unbelievable. So this kind of gives a, a face to the name um, for here for, uh, looks like he was 21 here in this photograph. And his father, uh, Billy G. Miller, as I mentioned before, he is the mastermind of Mature Magic and Miller Publishing. He's the guy that is actually running the business, running the publication end of things. So really interesting history there on John Tarr. So anyway, let's let's get into it. Uh, so he sent me these. Uh, he sent me, um, let's first just talk about John Tar number two here, which is super, super, super cool. Um, this uh, is a, a different artist. This is not, uh, does not feature uh, Tony Lorenz, who we interviewed previous. This uh, showcases Dane Barrett's work. Very different, but still, you know, total, uh, you know, small press quality to this that we love. Um, and this story takes off, you know, where, you know, John Tar is reborn as a vigilante and the previous issue and now he finds himself on some you know kind of pirate island here and there's a bunch of different characters here that you'd never see coming in the series kind of based on the last issue but you know that's the unpredictability of John Tar that makes it so you know alluring and you know the master elf keeper returns ricochets you know uh, become a, a a very prominent theme he loves ricochets you know bullets ricocheting off his sword um yeah it's you know it's uh it's really interesting um and it's just cool to have another issue of this so that's awesome. Um, of course, John Tar 3, um, which is one of my favorite covers in the series. It's just an awesome, um, uh, you know, duotone there. And the back is really cool as it, uh, as it advertises the fourth issue, which we'll get to uh, here shortly. But yeah, the third issue is really cool. Also illustrated by Dane Barrett. So he has consistency there. 
Um, this is actually a little better illustration wise, even though obviously there's some <laughs> Barry Power comic faces going on here. But it's just really cool because this story, he's actually, John Tarr's arriving um, at this like haunted mansion that is uh, run by a fellow named Acid Skull, who is a you know fellow with his uh, skull head on fire, like a Ghost Rider type thing. And he uh, introduces him into this house and leads him into the basement where there's elves being held as prisoner. And then he meets this giant uh, globule, you know, Jabba the Hutt looking dude here um, named Fatso who has a reflective mirror in his stomach uh, where he's reflecting certain images. And then John Tarr is, you know, gazing into his gut as uh, the plight of the elven race is uh, unfolding before his very eyes. Um, you know, fun stuff. The art seems to kind of deteriorate here as the, as the issue goes on and kind of picks up again um, as we get out of the visions and go back into the, the haunted cellar. Really, really, you know, cool stuff. I actually really dig this issue a lot from a story point. It's, 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 it's really a lot of fun and has some trippy, you know, going through portals type thing. And, you know, anytime there's a portal in one of these comics, I tend to like it. Um, yeah, and so this is cool. Uh, again, another issue with John Tarr. Um, so John Tarr 3, and, of course, he, he included uh, a copy of... Uh, this is my second copy of this now that I own, which I'm very proud of, is the ultra rare, extremely rare... Uh, John Tar number four, um, which we have yet to post on Instagram or on Patreon or anything, but uh, we're definitely going to get to it uh, soon. Um, I want to get the rest of the John Tars up, and then we'll kind of cap it off and with you know this uh, with releasing this issue. This one's just amazing. Um, just by on all fronts, this might be my favorite issue. Um, it has another artist here. Uh, Bill W. Miller obviously wrote it. And Daniel Walker steps in to do the art, and I love his art. His art is actually amazing in this. And it's really cool because you see this kind of punk uh, cult, I guess you could call them, is uh, st you know causing a stir at a local church. Uh, you know, John Tarr is kind of being sought after by this female vigilante um, called Sophia Sappho. Um, and uh, the story actually is going to get pretty violent, which is something that's not really in the mature magic toolbox, uh, which was really shocking to me. But the cool thing about this issue is that characters from the first issue make their triumphant return, which was very comforting for me, you know, as a John Tar fan to see my old friends come back, you know, because it's, it's taken me 10 years to get this, to, to find this issue. And it's so cool to have a second copy that he, that he sent us, but it literally, you know, I, I only got it recently. And, you know, so to see, you know, Detective Dean Dolchek come back is is very comforting um you know and to see some new characters i think this this fellow is from issue number two um and uh i think the, the gym owner the um the gym owner kind of returns and which is awesome from the first issue and yeah and then there's this there's this crazy showdown involving you know this mohawked punk you know sophia and john tar and people are getting shot up in a church which is pretty brutal. And then this crazy thing happens where a grenade blows off the arm of Sophia, <laughs> leaving her dismembered and bleeding on the ground, which is, if you know, if you pay attention to any of the issues that have been uh, have been put out by Mature Magic, that is very out of the ordinary to go that extreme, um, which is awesome, which obviously is, is awesome and fresh. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing to point out here uh, about John Tar 4 too is in the beginning in the actual forward, you know, he, he, uh, Bill W. Miller, something I'm looking forward to speaking to him about in our inner upcoming interview is that he says, John Tar is not going on hi hiatus. He's announcing that it's going on hiatus. He's, he's had it. And John Tar is not going on hiatus because it is not selling because obviously to 25,000 copies, we are pulling it from the, from the racks because it is unappreciated. So he is not happy with the reception he's been getting critically, uh, and from readers on John Tarr, uh, you know, but hey, sometimes it takes 30 years, you know, for someone to find it and appreciate it. And so now we're, I'm really excited to be able to talk to him uh, on an interview on our YouTube channel to get the full story. Um, he also sent me um, issue number five of John Tarr Returns, one of my favorite covers. Um, I mean, look at this. This is incredible. Uh, this is a reboot series that uh, Bill did he kind of rebooted the story, so it, it did go on hiatus, and he pulled it from the racks. 
It was unappreciated, so he gave it one more try. Um, and there's five issues of John Tyre Returns. He included issue number five in here, which is awesome because I love this cover. And the artwork is so wild and um, amazing. It's about a, by a guy named uh, Rob Crosswhite, whose name comes up a little bit in some of the other issues that we're going to be looking at today. But yeah, just just, just amazing. You know, We're going to be getting into the John Tyre Returns series a little bit more. We haven't posted a ton of them on the Instagram yet, but those will be coming soon. But yeah, you can just kind of tell that still really has that small press Power Comics quality that we love. And um, this is a totally different story, you know, introducing kind of the same basic character of John Tar, but taking it in a different, different way. And this is Trial Run, uh, as it advertises in the back, which we're going to get to in a second here. Um, but anyway, yeah, awesome. John Tar Returns, number five. All right, now let's get into Power Defense. Um, when I saw this in the box that Bill W. Miller sent, I, I was so excited because this has actually been on my want my Power Comics want list for a very, very long time. Um, uh, and he included in his uh, written report here, uh, I just want to read something about this uh, really quickly because I think it's really interesting. <clears throat> he says... Um, uh, he was talking about how Power Defense was something he was really looking forward to being a really kind of breakout title. And he mentions in here, Power Defense was the name of the book, not the team. My intention um, was the characters would never formally become a team, but would often interact because they were all in the same locale with mutual friends and enemies. There was a lot of publishers at the time creating their own universes consisting of multiple titles. I wanted to fit my universe in one book. So I think the idea was to kind of unite a lot of the other characters that he was coming up with in this issue, which is really cool. But what I found particularly interesting is the backstory on it, which he says, um, which is very of the time. Home videos and tabloid TV talk shows were, were popular when I created Power Defense. So I chose the character Tabloid and his alter ego, Jorge Catera, to be the linchpin in the series to hold everything together. Jorge was my satirical take on Geraldo Rivera, who had his own syndicated talk show at the time. In fact, the pitch I used on Nick, who was the artist of this issue, to get him interested was, what if Geraldo Rivera was a superhero? So, amazing. Amazing TV talk, like, you know, yeah, like, tabloid TV talk show host turned uh, superhero. So, Power Defense, really excited to finally get this. Um, and you can see, this is later in the, in the Miller era because John Tar is 1986 and this is 1993 so we're going back here a little bit but this is just amazing because um you know it's 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 him going into the 90s it's it's definitely more accomplished it's not as visually interesting to me as John Tar but I just love the idea I love the idea of a TV talk show host uh turned into a superhero I think that's really really cool um just really playing into that early 90s uh pop culture so yeah, I was really excited to get this because I've been so curious on what this looks like. And I've never seen this issue pop up anywhere on Mile High or eBay or anything. This has been something that's been really, really, really cool to see. In the 90s, you can catch everything on video. So <laughs> I don't know what this is, but this looks like a superhero video cameraman uh, amazing hero too. So this is just awesome. Power Defense gets a major thumbs up for me. Uh, okay. Now it's time to get to Rabid Rachel, which I have to admit truly is probably the coolest discovery out of this whole thing that he sent me. Um, and I want to go back. I want to refer back to the notes on this one. Uh, just look at this cover. It's, 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 it's amazing. Issue number one of three, it says on the back, it has this incredible illustration here. It's just awesome. Um, anyway, I just want to refer back to the notes because he does talk about um, Rabid Rachel here. Um, just got to find it. Yeah, here we go. So he gives a little backstory and the inspiration for this, which I thought was just really, really cool. Um, uh, okay, so Rabid Rachel. I've always liked werewolves. They're my favorite monster. But I wanted to create a character who is not a werewolf, but was empowered and influenced by one. Okay, that's radical. The concept came to me years earlier when I watched a documentary about how coyotes could hypnotize small dogs into running with their pack. Amazing. Why would a coyote lure a small dog astray? Apparently to gain trust so it could be later so it could later have puppy chow. <laughs> it's like written like John Tar. But no, I was not planning for Rachel to be eaten by the werewolf. So amazing. So this is a superhero character under the control 
of a werewolf, which is amazing. Um, I cannot wait to um, post this on Instagram. I'm actually, I might jump the gun on this one really soon because it's so cool and I've never seen it anywhere online. Um, obviously the art, you know, checks the box for us. And I believe this is drawn by, is this Robert Cross White? Yes, it is, or, or color is. I think Robert Zylo is the artist and Cross White might've done the cover who also did that John Tar Returns cover we just saw, but, you know, this is our, our kind of shit right here. I mean, just take a look. Um, and this, too, he also talks about in the letter about how this is the only time he used um, a typewriter for the lettering, um, you know, which is not my favorite. Uh, I don't think it's anyone's favorite uh, when, when these power comics take that direction. Um, but he mentioned that at the time they could never afford a proper letterer and he was very upset with how the lettering of his comic books, um, looked, uh, you know, the ones that he was doing. So he decided that he would, uh, he would give it a, give it a try here with the typewriter and it's actually his father, Billy G. Miller, who actually is the one who did do the typewriter lettering on this issue. So this is a real family affair here, family run business, which is really cool. And you can just see, you know, the heart and soul that's into this family company here. And this just looks amazing. I mean, just for a minute, like, you know, this is a really, really cool story, which I have actually not read yet. So, but, um, so I don't really know the full story, but I mean, you can just tell this is really, you know, there's a, <laughs> a Jonah uh, lookalike here, but you know, this is just amazing. And the back cover is just so cool. Um, and just, I just love the color treatments they have on these. It's just such an amazing zine quality that they gave their issues. Okay, so now Trial Run um, is uh, another issue. We've actually posted this before. It's another series. Uh, I think we've, we've put this on, on Instagram before. Um, but this is, th this is definitely kind of neat. And he goes into detail on it, uh, of course, in the, um, in the notes he sent. But uh, this is interesting because this is back in 1987, so a year after the first John Tarr. And of course, Bill W. Miller is uh, at the helm here uh, with a different artist, Mike uh, Bar Barriero, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but um, you can see this looks pretty accomplished, you know, and uh, sci-fi kind of, you know, tale here, kind of has like some underground comics influence here, um, especially with these weird little mousy creatures that are roaming around, um, you know, and this is a basically, this is a full story. This is a full-fledged story here um, running throughout the whole issue and the original idea, oh, amazing. Wow, I didn't even notice that this advertised John Tar 4, which is pretty cool. But, uh, and whatever this is, whoa. I don't even know what that is, but that's amazing. Um, but the thing about this is, is that this was originally intended to be uh, a story just about this this guy, Ace Havens, a sci-fi series. But uh, in in his notes, uh, Bill W. Miller references the fact that it, they as they were doing the John Tars and there was demand, they were having a hard time actually keeping up with uh, a production schedule, staying on time, getting the art right, getting everything else right. Um, and so he, Bill W. Miller transitioned the Trial Run series to become kind of more of like a, uh, he mentions it here, like a Marvel Presents or a Marvel Spotlight or a Marvel Premiere, um, where it would feature different artists and smaller, more of an anthology type thing. So that's what this kind of became and spawned so many of them. And um he sent me a bunch of them. I own a bunch of these, but this actually ran for 15 issues, I believe, which is actually really impressive. Anything running for 15 issues is super impressive. Um, but this is amazing. And this is the one that like, I wanna just give a spotlight to because I'd never seen this cover before and it's everything I love. First off, take a look at these dudes, number one. Number two, Slayhawk is what we're calling this. Amazing. So I don't have trial run number two, but this is number three. And yeah, so this is a story about Slayhawk. Welcome to my nightmare. Yes, everything about this is a yes. Uh, I can just hear uh, Benjamin Mara freaking out about this already. Um, so amazing, um, you know, this is a, uh, an amazingly incredible story. Uh, and we're gonna post this whole thing very soon, but you can tell it's a, a short little, uh, probably eight pager here on Slayhawk. And then it gets into like, as you see that now it's an anthology with different stories, unfortunately not as cool, even though there's a pentagram here, uh, you know, as cool as Slayhawk, like Slayhawk, you know, I wish I could have get in a time machine, go back, say Bill W. Miller, just, you know, 
maybe Slayhawk should be the thing you really uh, focus everything on, your, all your energy on. Anyway, amazing. Uh, love it. So that's number three. Um, here, I'm going to, these are actually in reverse order. So yeah, number one we looked at. <clears throat> this is number six, which he talks about in his letter, which is pretty amazing. This is a mashup of Kiss and the Beatles. Um, and he talks about in uh, the artist that came to him with this idea. His name is Larry Blake. He has uh, he had the idea of doing this Beatles Kiss mashup. They were worried about legal issues doing this, but they, they took the risk and did it. Uh, the unfortunate thing is there was a printing error, as you can tell in the front cover, which made the Beatles look like they had measles, as he says in his um, uh, in his uh, in his amazing letter to me. So you can you can you can tell that. Um, so I'll make sure I didn't mess up the focus here. Okay, yeah. So anyway, yeah, we take a look inside, but yeah, it's just kind of amazing. Here's just kind of a one shot rock and roll mashup here uh, with Kiss and the Beatles. Uh, obviously the um, this is the air car uh, era of the uh, of of Kiss um, <laughs> come together. Pretty cool. There's Gene out of makeup. You know, pretty 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 fun little thing. Great illustrations actually in here too. Um, and yeah, just just going wild with this kind of rock and roll fantasy fiction here. I love Goliath. I don't even know what that's all about. Can't wait to read this. Haven't haven't read this yet. Um, but this is this is really exciting. Get back, awesome. So there, yeah. This is just really thought out, really cool. And look how freaking cool that is, man. This should be a poster. Uh, I just love the color separations here and what they're doing with this this back printing. It just looks super awesome, almost like a blacklight poster or something. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that's really cool. Um, let's look at uh, oh yeah, Trial Run Swamp. This is pretty cool. Uh, this this is just I just love. How kind of stoic and uh, this 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 cover is looking into this with the RV and just a swamp you know getting into the swamp life um, but then there's like weird wonky robots coming in here right off the top which was I was not expecting when I first looked through this but then you can get to see like here's the actual swamp story which you know is really cool that trial run kind of features more of like a dramatic tale uh, kind of southern gothic if you will <laughs> so that's really neat obviously Advertising trial run in the back. Uh, there's uh, these two, trial run 14. This one is kind of fun because it looks like a misprint. It has two covers on it, which I think was it's kind of fun. But I'll just flip through these real quick just so you can get kind of a sense of, you know, where this was going, man. But this is, you know, this is issue number uh, 14. You know, these guys are are, are are cranking these out, you know, and, um, and, and feeding the market with them. Yeah, there's again the double cover. And then, of course, issue 15 he sent me, which is really cool. I actually already have this issue, but it's amazing. Kilgore, the zombie hunter. This one is one of the cooler ones, actually, um, in my opinion. The artwork kind of looks like the Adventures of BOC, just with that real scratchy um, scratchiness to it. And, um, you know, zombie stuff, super cool. You know, yeah, this one's really cool, actually. have yet to actually sit down and read it, but, you know... It's got everything you want from the era. That's cool. Um, awesome. And then these are just some of the ones that I already have that he did not include, but just thought I would show as I'm here. I have Trial Run. This is number five, which I always thought was a really cool cover. This one's a really cool cover. The Web of Intrigue, number four. I just love it with the pentagram and this, this awesome creature here, the Anubis. Um, amazing. And this is Trial Run number three. Uh, or number 13, I'm sorry, number 13 which I, already, I also have. All right, so um, now let's get into Scorpia. Uh, Scorpia, as he outlines here in the notes again that I'll reference, um, he mentions that this is my favorite of all the books Dad published. I had nothing to do with it, and Russ Martin dealt exclusively with Dad. So this is a, comp this is a, uh, this is a uh, uh, collaboration uh, between Bill W. Miller's father, and it looks like uh, artist... Um, Russ Martin, as I just said. But doesn't this scream Benjamin Mara right off the top? Like, this is amazing. Uh, so this is like, to me, when I look at everything that he sent me and everything with Miller Publishing, this looks like almost to me the most uh, accomplished thing. Uh, and that could be why Bill W. Miller likes it so much. Like, for the time period, this looks like, as a, for a black and white comic, you know, the most accomplished, fully formed, 
you know, the artwork is, I mean, it's small, um, but it's, it's cool. I mean, look at this, look at this, these backgrounds. And, you know, this is like maybe one of the more pro things that he's done. It's, it's obviously very pulpy, as you can tell. Um, again, it's not, you know, my favorite, obviously, you know, I tend to like the more crude style, but you know, this is cool, man. And of course, advertising a trial run issue here and also very notably, uh, a rabid Rachel, which now we own. Um, awesome. And, um, yeah, some more trial run covers, um, and the John Tar returns five. So you can just tell man Miller publishing on fire here. There's a second issue of Scorpia, which he sent me, which is really cool. Um, Again, it's just, you know, same kind of deal, man. You know, um, accomplished, decent looking, um, black and white, pulpy, self-published thing. Uh, so now let's get into Wild Man. <clears throat> so Wild Man is something that he wanted me to, to clear up for everybody here. So Megaton Comics published these two um, issues here, which he sent me. It's, it was included in the box. Um, and these uh, are um, comics uh, by Grass Green, um, who is a sort of indie, self, small published uh, hero. Uh, he's an African American guy. He kind of is the self proclaimed uh, first black underground comic book artist. So he's, he had been around for a long time. And in, in Bill Miller's uh, letter to me, he mentioned that Grass Green got the name Grass because he was called Grasshopper in the Army because of his speed. I'm not sure if he was like in Vietnam or something like that. That seems like that would fit the time period, but he got the name Grasshopper over in the Marines and it's stuck and so he was known as Grass Green. And so anyway, he published, there's these two issues, number one and number two, which came out uh, through Megaton Comics. And I don't know exactly the story uh, that these actually came out and then uh, Megaton stopped publishing them and, uh, Miller Publishing picked them up. So, and, and, and actually, uh, published a wide array of these, which he sent me a bunch of, and I actually have over the years collected, um, uh, a bunch of these as I've seen them pop up in dollar bins or, you know, it's just searching Miller Publishing on, on the internet. So it's really cool that, you know, they, Bill W. Miller and gang saw, you know, I think the story is that Grass Green and Bill Miller Sr. Um, really did um, kind of have a uh, kind of I, I think he met Grass Green at some comic convention. They struck up a conversation and then he said, oh, I can publish your stuff. And so they published, I think, 15 issues of this. Oh, crucial to note here. Banyan of the High Forest. F sorry. Banyan of the High Fortress. One of our favorite uh, Miller publishing uh, works, which we've covered extensively on our Instagram and Tumblrs in years past, but another, that's another thing Miller did. So these are really cool. Um, there's a lot of them. I don't, I won't go into all of them, but this cover has always um, intrigued me. And it's just cool to know that that backstory, you know, of um, that they really championed his work and published so many of these that like you can see. And they're, they're, they're really cool, you know? I mean, again, not my, style per se and and what we tend to cover on on power comics but just a really cool piece of history man i mean it's a little too cartoony for me but you know i i i just think it's really cool and some of these are just very crudely xeroxed as you can see there but really cool really cool um and these covers are just awesome too you know i mean that and and of course the color separations but these are almost very zine like i mean this is really crude I love this crude ad for Banyan of the High Fortress, too. It's really cool to see that. Um, and so, um, yeah. So then, oh, <clears throat> let's get to the final item in the unboxing. <clears throat> the final comic, that is, which is Vampire Bites. Um, and in his, in his letter to me, he uh, called out that this is actually um, published uh, by Brainstorm Comics. So this is the first thing that Bill W. Miller did outside of his own publication. And uh, this is an adult comic. It's very adult. Um, but it is a vampire story set in a place called Vampire Park. And uh, Bill lines out in the, e in the letter that um, he wanted this to be his version of Twin Peaks. He wanted to create kind of this mysterious <clears throat> world where, you know, vampires are running around and there's mystery and intrigue, but it also gets pretty sexy. 
So, you know, <clears throat> we don't have to dwell on that too much because there's some pretty graphic stuff here. But you can see here this pretty wild crunched, you know, gatefold here. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, it, it, it goes into the adult territory pretty aggressively here as it goes on. But um, just another bizarro thing in the Bill W. Miller canon, which is also interesting, too, because <clears throat> he also does touch on in the letter. Uh, where's the letter now? I miss things here. He touches on in this letter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where is it? He talks about, um, oh yeah, he talks about a collaboration he did called Heart Eater, which was a adult series that he partook in early on in his career. And um, he regrets it deeply. He regrets deeply being part of anything that would kind of have a smutty quality to it because he didn't want to degrade uh, comics as an art form. Um, and so it's really interesting that he would then later on go on to do this. Um, but, you know, uh, attitudes change, career moves, you know, you know, uh, things, things change, you know. Um, <clears throat> so the other kind of cool things I wanted to share here, he sent us his first ever strip that uh, he uh, wrote, which came out in 1983 which is this kind of just really interesting story about a cat and mouse <clears throat> burglar of some kind. It's called Stalker and the Sneak. And he photocopied that for me, which is very adorable and awesome. Um, <clears throat> and the last but not least, he sent the original, this is going to freak some people out, the original movie pitch for John Tarr, which uh, dated by this here, uh, is April 21st, 2006. And he told me on the phone, one of the first things that we talked about when we finally connected was that at one point in time, a production company tracked him down and optioned the rights for John Tarr to make a movie, which I could not believe. Um, I might now uh, reach out to him and try and make that movie. But anyway, you can see some concept art here. Definitely riding the 2006 vibes here pretty hard. Um, but yeah, it, it goes in to explain the story. John Tard, The Pinnacle Sword is an urban fantasy set between New York City and the realm, and, sorry, and a realm beyond space and time. John Tard is a man who finds purpose in his life through struggle, yet he will learn that it is not his battle alone. He is just another foot soldier in a war not against flesh and blood, but in opposition to agents of spiritual darkness and princi principalities. John Tard, The Pinnacle Sword is a proposed film project based on characters and situations created by Bill W. Miller. The source material is from a four-issue comic book series, John Tarr, published in, 80, in 1986 and 1987, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, <clears throat> a completed screenplay for the film has recently been optioned, gotta get that screenplay, by Laid Low Pictures, while it is based loosely on issues one and four of the first John Tarr series. That's a good call, by the way. Good call right off the bat. One and four are the best. The movie script is an entirely different entity. <clears throat> To compare the future f future film to the past books is akin to the proverbial apples and oranges. <laughs> no, the, uh, the the movie should be a literal uh, page by page, frame by frame adaptation, my my friend. Uh, whereas the books were often a compromise of creative visions between the writer and associated assorted artists. Always throwing the artist under the bus is Bill W. Miller. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we interview him. The dramatic new screenplay was written solely by the character's creator and is now the definitive version. So trying to rewrite history constantly here with making this into uh, a uh, movie. And yeah, they're, 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 they're doing it all here. They're getting John Tarr in, they're getting the elves in, and they have a character breakdown. You know, they have John Tarr, Yaku, the master elf keeper. Who would play John Tarr, guys? Write in the comments. Who would you cast as John Tarr in 2006? Okay, that's very important. You know, like, uh, what's the guy from uh, Magic Mike? Like, would it be that guy? Who's a 2006 actor? Um, and yeah, Winker and Tinker, oh boy. Sophia Sappho and Constance the Matriarch, Sheila the Prodigal Daughter, Molly the Wayward Child. All these roles available in John Tar the movie. So that's it, man. Um, just to bring it back, like, I just, you know, this, this, this hefty stack of comics that was given to us uh, so graciously. I'll, I'll pull John Tar 4 to the front. Uh, by Bill W. Miller. Thank you so much, Bill W. Miller. I can't wait to interview you on this channel and to pick your brain on the history and the work that you've created here is pretty remarkable. Um, and, you know, if anyone out there watching this has any questions that you would like us to ask Bill W. Miller when we do interview him, please uh, put that in the comments as well. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and that's that's pretty much it for the unboxing. I just want to at the end here, gotta plug it. But <clears throat> if you do not know already, Power Comics has been really active on Patreon. We have been uh, slowly digitizing our entire collection of self-published comics and um, putting them online on patreon.com slash power comics, where just for five bucks a month, you can get access to this entire library where we are putting up all of our favorite issues. And, you know, so you can really look at them here in high res, uh, which is amazing. Zoom in on all the art and appreciate it in kind of a whole new context. Um, so you don't have to track down these issues like that we did painstakingly in the dollar bins and going nuts trying to find these things, spending way too much money and getting disappointed when things don't arrive or whatever. It's all here now. So you guys can appreciate it for just five bucks a month. Patreon.com slash power comics where you can get, uh, you know, all these, man, which is awesome. Uh, we've we've put up all of our where we're going to be putting up all of our favorite issues. Of course, John Tar number one is already up there. So. You know, you can follow along uh, and, and, and read John Tar. We're going to get all the John Tars up there eventually. And uh, please subscribe to the channel, uh, post comments. And if you have any weird comics that uh, we have not talked about or covered on the show, please send them in. We always accept tips and uh, want to see other uh, power comic uh, hunters out there. Anyway, that's it for now, guys. Take care. See you next time.